Well, I want to issue a special welcome to all of you joining us from Calvary, Quakertown. It's great to have you with us on this beautiful morning. Well, this morning we come to the conclusion of our Christianity Illustrated series in which we looked at a few of the parables that Jesus told. Now remember, Jesus didn't tell the parables to entertain. Jesus told the parables for people to take account of what's happening in their lives and then to challenge them to actually make changes and move in the direction in which he's leading. But before we get into concluding the series, I wanna take just a few seconds to talk about the series that we're gonna start next week. We're gonna call that series FaceTime Conversations with Jesus. And so in the parables, we looked at some of the places where Jesus is teaching. Starting next week, we're gonna look at few of the, a few of the encounters that Jesus has. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna realize that every time Jesus encounters someone or a group of people, they are changed forever. And it's been our prayer and our thought that as we encounter Jesus through those examples, through those accounts, we can be changed too as we put ourselves into the shoes and the sandals of those that actually encountered him face to face. Jeremiah Link is going to start that series. Jeremiah is our new pastor to young adults. And so he spoke here a couple of months ago. Well, he will be here starting the series next week. So I encourage you to come. Uh, welcome Jeremiah to our staff and to our church. Well, back to Christianity Illustrated for the last installment. As usual, if we're gonna understand what's going on in a parable, we have to understand the context. If you don't know the context of what's going on as Jesus is getting ready to tell the story, it's hard to figure it all out. Well, when it comes to the context, the first thing you have to realize is that this parable that we're gonna look at comes at the end of a sermon. The most famous sermon in all of history is not a sermon that I gave, but it's a sermon that Jesus gave and it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, a couple of years ago, we actually took a number of months and walked through the Sermon on the Mount and we called the, the series The Genius of Jesus. Well, the last part of that sermon is a parable, but you have to understand a little bit of the context. In understanding the context, Jesus sets up a series of twos, two, two, two. So for example, at the end of the sermon, there are two gates and two paths, two trees, two kinds of fruit, two houses, two foundations, two results. There aren't three, there's not five, there's always two. We've got to choose. Is it A, is it B? There's not C and D and E and F. Is it A or is it B? Which of the two roads will you choose? Which of the two gates? Which of the two trees? Which of the two fruit? Which of the foundations and therefore experience which of the results? All good communicators always do that. At the end of a lesson, a good teacher. At the end of a speech, a great orator. At the end of a sermon, a great preacher will always call for a commitment. The person will say, now, on the basis of what you've been hearing, on the basis of what I've been saying, what are you gonna do about it? So what? So you've got more information now, what are you gonna do about it? That's what Jesus is doing at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He just preached for like three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and then at the end he says, so what are you gonna do about that? So what? That's the context, two, 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 you've gotta choose. But there's a challenging part of the context as well, kind of a compelling challenge. It actually begins at the beginning of the sermon and runs all the way through the end. But more than that, this challenge begins at the beginning of the Bible and runs all the way through the end. Here's the challenge, the challenging uh, contrast that we see beginning in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Here's how it begins. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Do you see the challenge? Do you see the challenge in context? There's a big contrast between the crowds and the disciples. That's always the challenge in the Bible. Jesus loves the crowds. He has compassion on the crowds. He feels for the crowds. He speaks to the crowds. He heals people, he heals people in the crowds. But the contrast is always 
Calling people from the crowd to be disciples. Calling people from being observers to being participants. Calling people from the audience onto the playing field. Calling them from the crowd to be disciples. It's kind of interesting as you read through the New Testament, that's always the case. Whether it be Paul or John, Jesus, they speak to the crowds but they're compelling people, challenging people to become disciples. Uh, let me see if I can make that point. How many of you have ever attended a Phillies game? Raise your hand. I hope it wasn't against the Marlins. Like, what is up with that, right? Uh, well, we better not go there for now. Well, I've attended a few Phillies games, and I'm always a little ticked off at a Phillies game because I played baseball growing up a little bit. They never asked me to come out and join the team. And, you know, I can feel, I, I would show you, but I don't, you know, I don't want to have a big head up here showing you how I could field and hit. But they never asked me to come on the field and play. They leave me as an observer. I've attended a few uh, Springsteen concerts in my life. And, and one of the things ticks me off there, the stage would be big enough for one more player. And uh, I took guitar lessons for three weeks one time from Mr. Feller when I was in elementary school until, you know, better options came along. I dropped that. But they never asked me to come up and join them as they play. I stay in the audience, but I'm never asked to kind of join the band. I'm a member of the crowd at a Phillies game. I'm a member of the crowd at a concert. But I'm never a participant. Well, the amazing thing about Jesus He's always challenging people from the crowd to be a participant. It's as if Jesus on the ball field says, well, you guys come on down and play. I've got positions for all of you. Come on and play. Um, I don't care if you've had music lessons or not. Come on up onto the stage. You can join the band. And that's the compelling challenge that we read through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking to the crowds, but he's compelling them, challenging them to become apprentices, to join the band, to join the team and become disciples, not just members of the crowd. Well, now that you kind of know the context, we're ready to read the parable. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the end of Matthew chapter 7. If you're using your phone or whatever, you can find that on you version or whatever Bible version you use, your iPad, whatever. And let's read the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, beginning in verse 24. We'll read through the end of the chapter. And keep in mind, Jesus is calling people from the crowd to be participants and listen to the compelling way in which he does it. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So as Jesus is landing the sermon He's challenging them to move from the crowd to the band, to the team, to become participants. Well, let's uh, look, at, look at the pictures. What's actually going on? Now, I've told you numerous times in this series, if we're going to understand a parable, the first thing you have to do is look for the, uh, look for the change. Look for the variable. And if you understand the variable, you understand the point of the parable. Well, what's the variable? The variable is not the houses. The variable is not the storms. The variable is the foundation. That's the difference. You've got to find the variable. And so if you understand the variable, you understand the point. The second thing I've said throughout this series is you've got to read yourself into the story in order to be hit by the story. It's not just the story to entertain. Jesus tells these parables so we read our lives into the stories. And so which one of those two builders best represents you? And how are you building and what will the results one day be? Well, according to the pictures, the two houses are the same or very similar. Jesus wants us to have this picture in mind. 
As you're walking down the street and you see the two houses, from every possible angle, the homes look exactly the same. There's no difference in the homes. The shutters may look the same, the front doors are the same, the square footage is the same, same kind of roofing shingles, same siding. Everything looks the same. There's nothing noticeably different in the two houses. That's the point. If the houses are drastically different, the parable falls apart. The houses are the same. And also the, uh, the storms are the same. The point is not that one house receives really ferocious storms, and the other house just gets, yeah, a little wind and rain. No, the storms are exactly the same. The storms come on both of the houses. The houses are the same, the storms are the same. And those similarities set up the main difference. So we have two similarities, the houses and the storms, and we have two differences. The one big difference is the foundation. That makes the major difference. Now, I really wanted to have a giant pile of sand up here this morning and a big boulder over there. And I was going to stand on top of the sand and wiggle my feet, kind of like quicksand, and I'd sink and fall over. And, but they said, no. Then I was going to climb over here and climb on top of the big rock and say, now, if you're going to build something, you can kind of build it on this. But they said, uh, no rock. So imagine a big sand pile over there. How secure is the house going to be if you build it on a pile of sand? How secure is the house going to be if you build it on rock? For a number of years, Kim and I would travel to New York City every weekend for about seven years. And almost every one of those weekends, we would drive over the Verrazano Bridge from Staten Island into Brooklyn. As we would drive over the bridge, I never, it never got old looking out to the left and seeing the skyscrapers of Manhattan and to the left of that, the Statue of Liberty. Now, if you've ever seen Manhattan skyline, it, from a distance, it, it looks kind of weird, right? It looks like these giant buildings are coming right out, of the, right out of the rivers, right? They're right on the edge. Why can you do that? Well, because Manhattan's a big rock, that's why. If you've ever been to Ocean City or Long Beach Island, they don't have skyscrapers there. You ever notice that? Like they don't have a 90-story building on Long Beach Island. Because Long Beach Island is sand. And in fact, if you go to the Barnegat end end, Barnegat light end, you'll notice that they kind of lose ground every year. If you go to the other end, they're kind of gaining ground each year. Or better yet, if you go to Wildwood, they keep gaining beach every year. And if you go to other places, they're losing beach. That's sand. You don't build skyscrapers on sand because they're shifting sand would cause the building to collapse. If you're going to build a giant skyscraper, you've got to build it on rock. Go to Manhattan, that's a rock. Go to Long Beach Island, that's sand. That's what Jesus says. If you're going to build a house, build it on a rock. Yeah, it's going to take a little more work, kind of in the construction phase, making sure everything's anchored securely. But when the storms come in the long run, that house will stand, but the house built on sand is going to go, and then the federal government has to pay to rebuild. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now, there's actually an interesting biblical point that comes up repeatedly in that parable. And here's the point. What is seen, the houses, are a result of what's unseen, the foundation. My guess is you don't go to the skyscrapers in Manhattan and admire the foundation. You don't, people have never stopped at your house and said, I love your foundation. How many courses a block do you have? Well, that's really great. No, they admire your garden. They admire the doors. They love the color of the siding. They love the new roof you just got. They admire the trappings, but never the foundation. But with a different foundation, the whole thing collapses. What is seen is actually caused by what's unseen. Remember Psalm 1? The fruit of the tree is seen in evidence that everybody gets to eat it, but the fruit is produced by what's unseen, the roots of the tree. There's the principle again. The house stands as a result of the foundation. The house is seen, the foundation's unseen. That's how it always works. We'll talk about in the lessons what that means. You got the pictures down? Two houses exactly the same, two storms exactly the same. Two things that are different. The foundations are different and the results are different. After the storm blows, the house that's built on sand is just washed away and 
never to be seen again. But the house that's kind of fashioned on the rock remains and stands forever. That's the point. All right, well, let's uh, tease out some lessons. And I would encourage you to think of these lessons, not just lessons for this particular parable, even though they're true for this parable. These are lessons from the whole series. And so I tried to think back over all those messages that we've had for the last number of weeks and said, okay, so what are lessons from the series that kind of show up in this particular parable? All right, here's the first lesson. Everybody builds a life. Everybody. Everybody. In other words, in the parable, everybody builds a house. You don't have a choice. I don't want to build a house, I'm going to rent. No, you've got to build a house. You've got to build a life. Now, you can build it with different kinds of materials. And you can take the easy way out and build it on a foundation that's pretty easy digging. Or you can build a life that's built on a hard foundation that's anchored and secure. It's going to take a while to dig. Or you can, but everybody builds a life. You don't have a choice to not build a life. Everybody builds a life. And we build that life day by day, week by week, month by month, decision by decision, attitude by attitude, priority by priority. It never ends. Everything we do and think and say, all the attitudes we live out, they're all part of building that particular life. You can't not build, everybody's building a life. I'm not sure if you're uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, life continues to slip by. You ever get those feelings? Well, I get those feelings pretty regularly, not because I'm getting old and decrepit, even though that's true. Um, But I've begun to get those feelings like a few times a week. Here's when I get them. I get on the Stairmaster at the gym, and I punch in 30 minutes, fat burner, and I start to climb, and I can't wait for those numbers to hit zero, right? I mean, I'm praying, please go fast. I turn the TV up loud. I got all, please, please. I look down, like two seconds went by. Oh, I, I want the numbers to go quickly. I'm dying on this down. I want the numbers. But then just when I think I want the numbers to go quickly, I have the realization. But the numbers of my life are going by just like that. And pretty soon, 30 becomes 25, and 25 becomes 20, and 20 becomes 10, and 10 becomes 5, and 5 becomes 0, and Stairmaster's done for the day. But the reality is, I'll never get those 30 minutes back. And you're never going to get back the hour that you spent in this service. Everybody builds a life. We have to build it, and we build it every single day, every decision. You have to be building a life. You can't say, well, I'm not going to build a life today. You're building a life today, and you're checking out and doing nothing and just giving in to your passions and desires. That's building a life. And time is running out. Every day we build, and eventually the building's done. Everybody builds a life. Secondly, and I know you know this one, everybody experiences storms. Everybody faces storms. Storms are required. It's not like some people get lots of storms and other people don't. Storms are certain. Don't you hate that? I do have to tell you the other day I went to golf. Last thing I did, I I think whether people should be shot. (laughs) The last thing I did, I looked at my phone before I, 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 I turned the car off, looked at my phone. Sun, sun, sun. So rather than get into a hot car when I'm done, I figured I would leave the sunroof open. In the middle of the 15th fairway, dark clouds rolled in with wind, and I was in a torrential rain racing back to the parking lot to close the sunroof, and I opened it, and the seats are wet, so I'm cleaning up the car. Storms are certain. I'm never listening to the weather people again, except listen to this. Storms are certain. They may not come today. They may not come tomorrow. They're coming. They're coming. And if the house represents a life, storms represent all that kind of stuff that we wouldn't choose to come. Maybe this storm comes in terms of financial problems that you wouldn't have chosen. 
health concerns or problems, relational deterioration, heartbreak, family disunity. Storms can come in a variety of different ways, but storms are certain. In the parable, it's not that some lives get storms and other, every life gets storms. And don't look at someone else's storms and say, well, I wish I had your storms instead of my storm. You don't get that choosing, right? But every house has storms. Every life experiences storms. Every person experiences storms. And we would put those two things together. As the storm is coming, we're still building our lives, aren't we? And if your main objective when the storm come, comes is to escape, that becomes part of your building. If the main strategy when the storm comes is for you to self-medicate, then that's what you're going to do. You're going to run for pleasure. You're not building the right foundation, right? Everybody builds a life all the time, never stopping. Everybody faces storms. I don't know what storms you're facing, but I do know this. Absolutely with certainty. Some of you are in the midst of a storm right now and it took everything you had to get here this morning. Others of you are just coming out of a storm and you're kind of rejoicing and praising God. Oh, I saw me through the storm. Oh. Others of you are about to enter a storm. Sorry. But storms are certain. The timing isn't certain, but the storms are certain. You're either in a storm leaving a storm or entering a storm. That's the point of the parable. But what is seen, the house, is built on what is unseen, the foundation. Well, that brings us to our third lesson. And here's the thing we talked about in context. Everybody is either an observer or an apprentice, or an apprentice. Um, I like uh, Dallas Willard uses the term apprentice to refer to disciple. I'm not sure you realize this. Um, the word Christian is only used in the Bible like four times, maybe three or four times. The word disciples used tons and tons of times. Here's something you may not have noticed. Jesus never calls ever, never calls anybody to become a Christian, ever. He calls people to follow him. He calls people to be his disciple. Well, we've kind of watered that down and we call people to be Christian. I'm not saying don't be Christian, but you know, being Christian is you can be in the crowd and still be Christian. You can't be a disciple and be in the crowd. You can't be an apprentice and be in the crowd. Now, here's the really weird thing. Suppose you say, you know what? I'm going to learn how to golf. I'm going to buy a golf book. I'm going to watch YouTube videos. I'm going to learn how to golf. Or maybe someone else says, no, no, I'm going to learn how to do brain surgery. I'm going to watch YouTube videos. I'm going to be a brain surgeon. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy a book on brain surgery. Or better yet, I'm going to take some classes and become a brain surgeon. All right? Let me ask you a question. If you were to speak to somebody learning to golf and say, oh, are you learning how to golf? They would either say yes or no. And if they look disgusted and frustrated, that would be a yes. If you were to ask someone training to be a brain surgeon, Oh, are you learning how to be a brain surgeon? They would say yes or no. That doesn't mean we'd let them operate on us, but we, they would say yes or no. But here's the weird thing. If you were to say to lots of people, are you a Christian? Are you following Jesus? They'd say, well, I hope so. I think maybe. I'm planning on that one day. Well, oh, wait a minute. You're either, an apprentice, you're either learning, training to be an electrician or you're not. You're either training to be a plumber or a carpenter or you're not. It's not like you're hoping and wishing. You either are or you're not. That doesn't mean you're a great apprentice. I mean, you may be a terrible apprentice. There are lots of terrible students. But are you enlisted as a student, an apprentice, or are you just kind of playing as part of the crowd? That's the point. Everybody is either an observer of what Jesus did and what he said, or they're an apprentice. They're practicing. You know, it used to be in our, in our world, everybody went to work as an apprentice. So if you wanted to learn how to do this particular trade, you'd attach yourself to an apprentice. And even today, there's lots of mentoring and internships. They're all based on the principle of apprenticing, where you attach yourself to somebody who knows what they're doing, follow them around, kind of duplicate that, give them some feedback, and eventually you get better and better at it. That's exactly what Jesus does. He calls people from the crowd and says, hey, be my apprentices. 
follow me, put into practice what I'm doing, do what I do. Oh yeah, continue what Jesus started. That's being an apprentice. That's what we're called to do. So maybe as we're coming in for a, a landing on the series and on this message, maybe that's a question we all need to ask, we need to answer. Am I an observer? I mean, I show up faithfully Sunday mornings, right? I, I come to the nine o'clock service, I'm committed. I watch on the app when I'm not there, I'm in. But are you just an observer, part of the crowd? Or have you crossed the line and you're an apprentice? You're kind of putting into play what Jesus said and you're following him and what he did. I was thinking of a couple of examples. How about, how about these? Suppose you make application to the greatest corporation in the world. They have the best CEO, everything runs seamlessly. The CEO is a leadership genius. The CEO cares and shepherds people. The CEO is a strategic animal, right? I mean, the CEO is the best that there is. You make application and they hire you. Don't ask me why, they hired you. And you sit down after you've been hired with the CEO and the CEO says, you're gonna report directly to me. Nobody in between, you're gonna report directly to me. Now, um, here's a skill set I would like you to develop. Here's some things I want you to learn. So here, you go do that and suppose you say, eh, no, I don't wanna do that. I wanna be part of the corporation. I, I want an office. I want a paycheck, I wanna get benefits. I wanna get promotions and raises, but I don't wanna do what you say. I wanna do what I wanna do. How long would you work there? And my guess is you wouldn't quite be finished that conversation and you'd be done. You'd, you'd be out of work already. Or how about this one? Suppose you get drafted by the best, organiz best sports organization in the world. I hate to say it, maybe the Patriots draft. I, I mean, the coach is a strategic genius. He's not very personable. He's smart. He puts the players in position to win. He takes players that were written off by other teams, puts them in a position, everything. You get drafted and the coach at the first meeting says to you, okay, now look, here's how we do it. In practice, you're gonna run through these drills, gonna step out these programs, you're gonna do all these things. And when you do that, you'll fit into the program. Suppose you say, ah, I don't like practice. Just call me AI, I don't like practice, right? <laughs> um, I don't run drills like that. I don't like, I don't like getting hurt. In fact, I wanna be part of the team. I wanna wear a championship ring. I wanna have a jersey with my name on it. I want to run onto the field at the beginning and have all the fans stand and clap. I want to do that. But I don't want to practice and I don't want to play according to those rules. I want to do what I want to do. How long would you be part of that team? Hmm. Probably that meeting's about the end of it. Why then when it comes to following Jesus do we have a whole different paradigm? Why when it comes to following Jesus do we have... Well, yeah, I'm gonna follow Jesus and rather than continue what Jesus started, I'm gonna continue doing what I wanna do. But I've got Jesus in my, wait a minute. Wait. If it doesn't work for a CEO in a corporation and it doesn't work for a team and a coach, why in the world do we think it's gonna work with Jesus and God? Notice what Jesus says in the parable. If you put into practice what I'm telling. He didn't say, hey, if you showed up today and heard the message, he didn't say, hey, if you're really entertained, he said, if you put into practice what I say, guys, that's what, if you're going to be an apprentice, you put into practice what the coach and the CEO says. That's how it works. And when you do put it into practice, day by day, week by week, decision by decision, attitude by attitude, you're building a life on the rock that when the storms come, it never shakes. Well, one last lesson that we probably need to think about for all the parables, but it's certainly true in this one. Everybody should count the cost. Count the cost. And so I'm just shooting straight, but Jesus did. I'm just shooting straight. Um, it's going to cost you something to follow Jesus, just to let you know. Jesus is going to say, well, yeah, you know that, uh, you know that priority you've got? We need to change that a little bit. 
I've got other priorities that I want you to live by. Oh yeah, those words that do that, those living for yourself all the time, yeah, yeah, we need to kind of switch that up a little bit. Now again, you're in training, you're an apprentice, it's gonna take some time, I'm willing to work with you, but if you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna be a disciple, if you're stepping out of the crowd, if you're gonna be an apprentice, it's gonna require some, there's a cost to that. During the Second World War, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. Yeah, we don't like books like that today, right? We want the benefits of discipleship. The feel good, the happy, and, and there are all of those things too, right? But there's a cost. And so I want you to follow this thing with your eyes open, right? Jesus, hey, there's a cost. Oh yeah, yeah, as long as we're talking about cost. There's a cost in not following Jesus too. So don't just measure the cost of following. There's a cost to not following. Now, we could take a long time to describe that, but let me just mention a couple things. If you choose to not follow Jesus, you will live a roller coaster life. You have to. And when things are going well, you'll think you're the smartest, most disciplined person in the world. You've got life licked. And when the bottom falls out and the storm comes, you will think you are scum or you'll blame other people and you'll be a miserable person to be around. And you'll be patting yourself on your back and kicking yourself in the butt over and over and over and over again. That's how you'll live. And you'll live with fear and anxiety, wondering what's coming. Is it going to be a high season or a low season? How that's all going to work? If you're in charge of your life or just fate is in charge of your life, that's going to be a pretty wretched way to live. And how's that story end? Well, there's a storm. Interesting in the Bible, storm often refers to judgment, like before the judge. I finished reading Revelation today. Well, it wasn't even on purpose. It just, that's where I'm at. Yeah, there's a cost at the end, too. So count the cost. There's a cost to following Jesus, and there's a cost to not following Jesus. Make your choice with your eyes open and move into the decision with confidence, with wisdom, and with integrity. Let's stand and pray. Father, we give you thanks for this parable and all of the others. Jesus, the master teacher, the genius communicator who understands that there are two roads and two gates and two doors and two trees and two houses and two foundations and two results, and there's only two. Lord, I pray for all of us. Will you help us to realize, not just this morning, but day by day, that we're all building a life. And storms are coming. And we can either observe what Jesus says and what he does, or we can be an apprentice and choose to follow. And help us to make those decisions widely, wisely, counting the cost on both sides. We pray in the name of our parable teller and our Savior King. Amen.